There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. I was speaking on the subject of womanhood several years ago in a large church in Boston, after which a young woman came up to me, chewing gum a mile a minute, and she said, you know, I, I disagree with some of the stuff you said. <laughs> I said, fine, would you specify two points? Well, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, I don't like some of the stuff you say. (laughs) And I said, now, wait a minute. You've already said two different things. You started out by saying you disagreed with me, and then you said you disliked what I said. That really isn't the same thing, is it? You may dislike a lot of things I say, but in order to disagree, you had better be able to present a case to refute my arguments. I was trained in debating in college, <laughs> and it's not good enough just to dislike it. Well, I don't know. She said, I mean, like, you know, I don't like to think of myself as a woman. <laughs> well, I said, how do you like to think of yourself? <laughs> well, um, I mean, like, you know, I like to think of myself as a person. Well, I pressed the girl a little bit to try to find out precisely what this means. Is it possible to think of oneself as a person without reference to sexuality? And since I had not succeeded in budging her so much as an inch in the first hour of my speaking, I really didn't have much hope that I would be able to in five minutes following the meeting, and I didn't. But I'm here to try to budge anybody that might take that view that you would prefer to think of yourself as a person rather than as a man or a woman. Part of the struggle that the church has always had throughout its history is to swim against the tide, to hold up to the light of Scripture the thoroughly secular ideologies by which the world operates. And to do, as Paul says in Romans 12, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. We are constantly in danger of this. And the issue of sexuality has been presented to us vehemently and confusingly over the past 10 years. We have those who call themselves feminists telling us that sexuality is insignificant, that it is a triviality, even an accident, that the more we can ignore, deny, obscure, and even transcend the distinctions between the sexes, the happier we'll all be. We have loud voices of those who call themselves feminists, People like Betty Friedan, who has said that we are in a sex role revolution to restructure all institutions, including child rearing, education, marriage, family, medicine, work, politics, economy, religion, psychological theory, human sexuality, morality, and the very evolution of the human race. Gives you an idea of the scope of their aims. (laughs) We have Jermaine Greer telling us that a woman's lot is a lifetime of camouflage, an idiotic ritual full of forebodings and failure. We have a novelist like Erica Jong who has produced some very raunchy novels. In an interview recently on the Today Show, she was asked if she's a feminist. And with a scornful laugh, she said, you cannot be an intelligent woman and not be a feminist. We have women who call themselves biblical feminists, who are represented by such people as Dr. Virginia Mullencott, who has made the statement that rule and submission 
are a curse. And in a conference in Washington called the Evangelical Women's Caucus in 1975, in which she gave the keynote address, she made her platform very clear. That is to interpret the Bible as favorable to the cause of equality. And in the process of such reinterpretation, it was clear to me that this will necessitate a reinterpretation of the doctrines of the Trinity, of the creation, and of inspiration. So the question before us this morning is that of sexuality. What does masculinity and femininity mean? First of all, the nature of the question. Secondly, acceptance of the givens. And third, obedience to the call. We are being told that there is no difference between the sexes apart from the biological. And I think it's very important that we should understand that this is the platform of the feminist, whether she be a so-called biblical feminist or one who does not take the Bible as her authority. All are agreed that there are no differences between the sexes apart from the biological. This statement is not necessarily always articulated, but if pressed, you find that this is the presupposition of the feminist position. So, my question this morning is, is sexuality a stereotype or an archetype? A stereotype meaning uh, ideas which we have gotten purely from convention, and an archetype, a deep emotional response to an inner structure of the universe. One of the difficulties which I find invariably in discussing the question, wherever the question of sexuality in any form arises, be it women's liberation, homosexuality, women's ordination, the roles of men and women in marriage, the functions of men and women in the church, the difficulty which we find is so frequently that people seem almost pathologically incapable of discussing it theologically. The arguments which are propounded are almost always political, sociological, legal, pragmatic, or something other than theological. I have nothing to say on any of those bases. My remarks this morning, I believe, are theological. It is not, as far as I'm concerned, an economic, a legal, and sociological, or a political question. We have to go back to something vastly prior to all that can be said on those levels, and certainly some things may validly be said on those levels. To say all men are created equal is a political fiction, as C.S. Lewis puts it, necessary in the political world, but not by any means always desirable, and in my opinion, not applicable at all when we're talking about the realms of the church and the home. All arguments about equality, function, interchangeability of roles, the true meaning of liberation, hinge then on this prior question, does sexuality mean anything at all? If the answer is no, I have no further basis for discussion. I believe that the answer is yes. It means something. In fact, it means everything. And all of my remarks this morning will be an attempt to express what is finally inexpressible, the mystery with which we deal when we are dealing with sexuality ultimately is ineffable, but I'm going to do my best. I'm a Christian, and therefore I see the world as never an end in itself. Material things are not opaque. They are shot through with the presence of God. I don't mean by that that I'm a pantheist. But all of matter has been sanctified because this planet has been visited by the Creator himself. 
Jesus Christ in the Incarnation demonstrated once and for all that visible things have invisible significance, that physical things have metaphysical significance. And so that's where I take my stand. Sexuality means something. It is far more than a biological question. John Calvin, in his Institutes, said, true and substantial wisdom consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. It is plain that no man can arrive at the true knowledge of himself without first having contemplated the divine character and then descended to the consideration of his own. Sexuality has profound meaning, and I think right here is one of the clues to the so-called frustration that present-day women are supposed to feel. Women are told that they, if they don't feel frustrated, they ought to. And we are asked to carry chips on our shoulders, which I personally refuse to carry. There's no question in my mind that many women are frustrated. And I've tried to find out why that is. And it seems to me that one reason is because, not because the women's role is meaningless, but because it has been devalued and because its meaning has been lost. And we have been told and told and told with very strident voices that we ought to strive to measure up to masculine standards. And so the traditional symbols have been divested of meaning. Sex has been said to be meaningless, a triviality, an accident of our existence, to be ignored, erased, suppressed. If we get terribly spiritual, transcended. It makes no difference at all how we live our lives. If we give our little boys tea sets to play with and our little girls dump trucks, we can reverse the face of society. All of our notions about masculinity and femininity are purely socially conditioned. It's simply a matter of education. We can make our own rules. We need have no reference whatsoever to any created order or any ontological reality. We have a whole new stereotype to replace the stereotypes which have been ridiculed, a whole new system for justification for doing what we feel like doing and not doing what we don't feel like doing. And we're human, we're persons, we need not call ourselves men and women anymore. I found a very apt illustration of the situation in which we find ourselves when I read an article in the New Yorker a couple of months ago, I guess it was a year or more ago now, describing the 80 days spent in a space capsule by five or six men. They suffered most from what they called the lack of a local vertical. This space capsule was a cylinder on its side, and they literally had no way of knowing which end was up. Some of the difficulties that they had to contend with were that there was no way to take a shower because water doesn't fall in a weightless situation. They couldn't take a bath because water doesn't stay in a tub. It floats around in spheres, globes. Each day presented 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets, a situation in which they suffered from great disorientation. If a man tried to turn in a screw with a screwdriver, he found his entire body revolving and the screw <laughs> remaining stationary. One of the most infuriating difficulties was learning how to eat, because if any conversation was going on, a man might pause in midair with his fork full of egg, whereupon the egg continued its trajectory, <laughs> plastered itself all over his face. <laughs> so he had to learn to follow the food as rapidly as possible and attempt to direct it into his mouth. But when one man was asked to comment on this absence of a local vertical in which there was some reference point other than his own head and feet, his answer was, boy, it's so lousy, I don't even want to talk about it. And they came back confused, miserable, and exhausted. I think all of us 
men and women have been confused, exhausted, and made miserable by the bilge that we have been hearing on the subject of sexuality. Where is our local vertical? I find it in the Bible. In the first chapter of Genesis, we have a beautiful description of the creation of the world, which began with the making of distinctions. God separated light from darkness, the firmaments from the heavens, the waters from the earth. And then as a climax to the six days in which he created all the creatures and the plants of this planet, he made that most glorious creature, man. According to the first chapter, male and female. A splendid earthly distinction. We find in the first chapter of Genesis two things about which it does make sense to say that men and women are equal. They are equally in the image of God. They were equally morally responsible because God issued a command which was to both of them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. I have very short patience with the notion of equality if it's not defined. Equality really is quite meaningless with reference to anything at all, unless you know specifically what qualities you're talking about. How can you say red and blue are equal unless you specify that they are both colors in the same spectrum? E flat and C sharp, are they equal? Are men and women equal? We have to be extremely careful to define exactly what we mean if we say they are. In the second chapter of Genesis, I find much more specifically delineated the details of how the man and the woman were created. We find God discovering, as it were, the first thing in all of creation which was not good, and that was that man should be alone. And then we have what to me is a charming scene of God and Adam reviewing the circus parade of animals, as though in that collection there might be found a help suitable for Adam. And parenthetically, may I implore you, ladies and gentlemen, to expunge forever from your vocabularies that odious word, helpmate. There is no such word in the Bible. The archaic English of the King James uses the word meet, which means suitable, fit, adapted. There should be a comma after help, a help, comma, suitable for this man. And in that circus parade, which passed before them, everything from the aardvark to the zebra, there was nothing that could measure up to meet Adam's need. And so God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he took out of his side a rib, and out of that rib he fashioned or built, as the Hebrew word means, a woman. And he brought this woman to Adam and presented her to him, and Adam named her. And I have found in that chapter four things which provide for me a local vertical. I know who I am. As a woman, I know first of all, that I was made for something. Woman was made for the man. Now, in case you miss it in the second chapter of Genesis, miss it in all the clues of visible creation, miss it in all the rest of the Bible up until you get to 1 Corinthians, you can find it reiterated there. Paul says, woman was made for the man, not man for the woman. Secondly, she was made from the man. Thirdly, she was brought to the man. She was, in a special sense, God's gift. And fourthly, she was named by the man. And so, because the naming process in ancient times was extremely significant of authority, the woman therefore knows her place. She was made for the man to adapt herself, to be suited, to meet his needs, to help him. 
She was made from him. He is her source, her head. She is God's gift to the man. She is under his authority, named by him. Now that is the content. I know where I stand. I know which end is up. But you can't have content without form. And it's amazing to me that we seem to have missed altogether one of the more obvious data, one of the more incontrovertible data in this whole question of sexuality, and that is the physical body. If we reject these theories from the Bible, let's take a look at the physical body. Even the feminist, even the one who most vehemently rejects the significance of sexuality, cannot deny the physical distinction. Now, scientists are working on it. (laughs) They hope that very soon parents will be able to choose the sex of their children, and if they succeed altogether, we can do away with sex altogether. And what a boring, faceless world this will be. What a wasteland. God was the one who thought up sexuality. As C.S. Lewis says, you wouldn't have thought of it. (laughs) And if you had, who of us would have had the courage to take the risks that would be involved? But here is the physical body, an infuriatingly stubborn and unalterable datum. We are born with the standard equipment. We we are not given an option about which sex we would like to be, about what color we'd like to be, about what size or uh, who our parents will be or where we're, we're born. There are a great many things about which we have no such choice. But what does the male body signify? Strength, superior musculature, to denote the fact that the man was made to cherish, to protect, to care for. The word husband means to care for, to initiate, to act upon, to rule, to lead. The female body made to receive, to be acted upon, to respond, to adapt, to carry, to bear, to go down into death, to give life to another person, to nurture. This means something. To me, it means everything. It is the final clue, the initial clue, the final clue, the incontrovertible one. So we have the form of the physical body The forms in the universe which speak so loudly of power and passivity, of generativity and receptivity, of initiation and response, of what one of my students at the seminary called in a very brilliant paper that she wrote, paired polarities. Complementarity. That's what sexuality is about. And the image of God requires these two modalities, under which, one of which, each of us lives his earthly life. This is the nature of the question. It is a theological one, if sexuality means anything at all. Try asking a feminist what femininity means. She will have a very hard time if she attempts to answer the question at all. Most of them rigorously avoid the question. And at the Evangelical Women's Caucus in Washington, I searched in vain over the list of some 30 or 40 workshops for any discussion on femininity or the meaning of womanhood. There was one on the meaning of persons. But it seemed an odd omission to me that those who call themselves feminists so studiously avoid the question of what femininity is about. This brings me to my second point, the acceptance of the given. 
Sexuality is a question to the Christian of what we are, not simply of what we do. If it's purely a socially conditioned notion, if we women are the victims of a male plot from the year one, then it has to do only with what we do, and we can do what we choose. If, on the other hand, this physical reality has metaphysical meaning, it has everything to do with what I am. My sex is the most potent and undeniable of all the facts of my life. If you go out of this conference and somebody says, did you hear that Elliot woman, what was she like? You don't have to start out by saying she's a woman. You know that, first of all, by my Christian name. And normally when you walk down the street and you see somebody coming toward you, you know instantly whether it's a man or a woman. And if you don't know it instantly, you feel very uneasy until you find out. <laughs> it's one of the givens of our existence. You might describe that Elliot person as being middle-aged, tall, white, whatever, depending on what categories would have significance to the audience you're speaking to. But certainly my sexuality is an important datum. We have many things given to us which it is our business under the sovereignty of God to recognize and to accept with thanksgiving. In Eve's sin, described in the third chapter of Genesis, she refused three of the givens of her existence. First, her limitation in the garden. God built into the universe limitations for every order of being. So far as we know, only two orders of being have ever taken issue with their creator about those givens, angels and men. Clams glorify God by being clams. My Scotty dog, Macduff, is a lesson to me every day of the world because everything Macduff does is wholly terrier-like. He does what he is made to do, and he glorifies God thereby. Angels and men took issue. The tempter came along to Eve and called to her attention the fact that God had forbidden something. My second husband had three daughters when I married him, and he used to tell me about some of the experiences of their growing up, and he said that sometimes he and his wife would take them for an all-day trip, perhaps to the zoo or the park or fun fair, and they would be given the hot dogs and the cotton candy and the rides and whatever they wanted, and then on the way home when everybody was exhausted, somebody would see a McDonald's and ask if they could stop and have a Big Mac. And the answer was no. And you know what the response was. Oh, you never let us do anything. <laughs> Who responds like that? Nobody but us. God gave Adam and Eve everything that they could possibly want or desire and gave them a single restriction, and they couldn't stand it. And so they refused to accept that limitation. Secondly, Eve refused to accept her appointment as a human being. God didn't ask her if she wanted to be an archangel or a clam. He made her a woman, a human being, and she decided that she would rather be a god. Thirdly, she refused to accept the call to respond, her responsibility to respond rather than to initiate. She took the initiative. Adam, in his sin, was equally guilty. He refused his limitation, he refused his appointment, and he responded to Eve's sinfulness. We are to accept, as men, the gift of initiation. It's not an option. 
We are to accept, as women, the gift of response. It's not an option. We can rebel against it and sin. We can give thanks for it and glorify God. Lest anyone raise the objection, which is so frequently raised, that submission is an admission of inferiority of worth. Let's look at the Trinity. Theologians tell us that the three persons of the Trinity are co-equal, co-eternal, and consubstantial. The Holy Spirit witnesses only to the Son. The Son does the will of the Father. Lo, I come, he said in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will. Not my will, but thine. In loving, glad obedience, the Son offers up through all eternity the filial obedience to the Father, which the Father, in infinite and eternal love, offers to the Son before the foundation of the world. Is the Son worth less than the Father because he submits? Is the Holy Spirit of inferior value? Certainly not. There is a distinction in the way they operate. And the only way in which human language can describe the mystery of the relationship which obtains between Christ and the Church is a nuptial mystery. And Paul, with that incandescent intellect, gave up in his attempt to explain this mystery. All he could use was metaphor. And the metaphor which he used finds its most complete expression in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. You wives must learn to adapt yourselves to your husbands as you submit yourselves to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife in the same way that Christ is the head of the church and savior of his body. And in the end, he capitulates and he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. All through scripture, we find the use of metaphor to describe both sexuality and the relationship between God and his creation, between Israel, between God and his people Israel, between Christ and the church. The sexual metaphors describe those heavenly truths. And so, not comprehending this mystery, but giving thanks for it, I accept my femininity and the responsibility that goes along with being a female to respond. How do I obey the call to be a woman? I happen to go to a church in which every Sunday morning we say we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us, but thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. And I presume that includes all of us here. We women have done a lot of things we ought not to have done. You men have left undone a lot of things you ought to have done, and vice versa. We are equally guilty. We are miserable offenders. But to be a man under God, to be a woman under God, is a call to obedience. We recognize the invisible reality signaled by the physical phenomena, described in the creation story, 
sung about through all of poetry, all of mythology, all of history, up until the 1970s, in which for the first time in any society, the distinction between the sexes is attempting to be erased. All of the societies, as different as the expression of sexuality may have been from time to time and from place to place, have been in agreement that there is a distinction of immense importance. So we accept these phenomena. As Christians, we have no business obfuscating that distinction, erasing it, denying it, and certainly not in any lamentably misguided kind of spirituality or humility transcending it. In order to glorify God, I must glorify him as a woman. Also, right now, as a middle-aged woman, as a tall woman, as a white woman, as a wasp. My husband used to say, I don't know about this wasp club. He said, it's a club I never asked to join and I don't know how to get out of it. But it's one of the givens. In order to be obedient to the call to womanhood, I must recognize my place as God defines it and obey. And in this chapter, the fifth chapter of Ephesians, where Paul uses this beautiful metaphor, I'm told you wives must learn to adapt yourselves to your husbands. Same thing is repeated in Colossians 3. Wives adapt. Husbands love. Paul is so often accused of being terribly hard on women. The people who say that really haven't read Paul very carefully because Paul is much harder on men. He's simply putting down the things which God has shown him. It's not Paul's idea. But which is harder, to submit or to love your wife as Christ loved the church? Has any woman ever perfectly submitted to her husband? Never. Has any man perfectly loved his wife as Christ loved the church? Never. We are miserable offenders. But this is the standard. This is the call. Submit to one another. And this Christian submission will express itself in these following ways, says Paul in this passage. Wives, submit to your husbands. Children, submit to your parents. Slaves, submit to your masters. And in other passages in scripture, he refers to political authority as being ordained by God. I heard a woman talk on the subject of egalitarian marriage. She claimed that she and her husband had a beautifully working system where she earned half the money and washed half the dishes and he earned half the money and washed half the dishes. And she took as her text proof that this is a scriptural pattern, this very passage in Ephesians, using only the 21st verse, which says, submit one to another, and attempting with some very fancy verbal footwork to prove that there is no difference at all between the way a man submits to his wife and a wife submits to her husband. And so I raised the question as to whether or not she saw any difference in these kinds of submission. She said no. I said, may I then read this passage substituting or interchanging the verb, the nouns. She said, certainly, go ahead. So I read, you husbands must learn to adapt yourselves to your wives as you submit yourselves to the Lord, for the wife is the head of the husband in the same way that the church is the head of Christ. When I got that far, she said, wait a minute, you can't carry the analogy that far. <laughs> I believe with all my heart, ladies and gentlemen, that to make the sexes interchangeable, to erase this God-given distinction which goes far beyond any social pattern whatsoever, is morally degrading profoundly distorting on the deepest personal level 
It is destructive of the church and of society, and therefore diabolical. And I will say that wherever I have a chance. I am given a gift to glorify God, to obey the call that goes with that gift. I offer it back with thanksgiving. If I have a husband at home, which I no longer have, I would offer my submission first to God and then under God to my husband as my peculiar womanly gift. As men, you offer your gift of submission to the will of God in acceptance of authority over your wife. That authority is not earned, it's assigned. I didn't submit myself to my husband because he was more intelligent, more spiritual, stronger physically, better looking, taller than I. All those things happen to be true. That was not the reason for my submission. I submit to him first because God commands me to do so. Secondly, and this made it very easy, because I loved him. I offer to God my gift of submission. The peculiar gift of masculinity is initiation, authority. To be subject to the sovereignty of God, a man must exercise authority in the home and in the church. Now. In the secular world, all kinds of other things obtain. Those profound heavenly mysteries of which Paul speaks are played out in the arenas of the Christian home and the Christian church, not in the secular world. The home and the church are the custodians of that invisible reality. So we have clearly defined our place. And to quote C.S. Lewis again, the church and the home are the places to which we, with great relief, can return to reality. I happen to be a career woman, not by choice, but by necessity. I have to compete with men in the secular world. I am treated without reference to race, color, creed, and sex. And what a faithless, faceless, sexless wasteland the secular world is because of that. I can return with relief to reality, to my full meaning as a woman in the church, no longer in the home because I have no husband at home. But every Christian has this area in which these mysteries can be played out and in which he or she may offer up his gift to God. Sacrifice is not weakness. We have the example of Christ to prove it. Submission does not mean indecision. It's hard for me to imagine how anybody who listens to anything I say, reads anything I write, or looks at anything I do, can imagine that I am espousing the view which says women be zeros, women be doormats, don't use your gifts, don't open your mouth, just be a zero. Well, one plus zero equals what? Equals one, it does not equal two. How can a woman be a help, suitable? for her husband if she's a zero. Submission does not mean indecision. Obedience does not mean servility. Femininity does not mean frivolity. May God give us grace, courage, and humility to be men, to be true men, to be only men, under God, to be women, to be true women, 
to be only women under God. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today. And will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Thank you.